JavaScript can be passed to that, that node file. So once it's installed on your machine, FileMaker is generating all the code required to build something for you. And then rather than you building the JavaScript yourself, I've already taken the legwork out and just created all the function calls you need. Because you're a steely-eyed missile man. <laughs> <laughs> Love the reference. It's time for the DevCast. I'm here again with John Newhoff and his band of merry men. We're going to be talking about depersonalized data. John, John's coming to us from his boat. Where are you at, John? Uh, I'm in False Creek, uh, Vancouver, British Columbia, currently. On a week-long, uh, week-long re remote work cruise. Oh yes, remote, <laughs> remote work. Is that what you're calling? It? How how much how much is the remote part, and how much is the work part? <laughs> uh, it's varying, four to five hours a day. Well, it's good to own the company. It's good to be the good to be the king. <laughs> <laughs> Jacob, how are you this morning? Good. Just enjoying the sunny day here in California. <laughs> oh, that's amazing. We're going to get 83 degrees here today in, in Washington. So I'm We're at 75 already over here. That, that's awesome. <laughs> <I'm> early. <laughs> and Joe, what do you have to say for yourself? Are you ready to go talk about depersonalized data? Uh, sure, that sounds like a topic that most people don't talk about maybe maybe for a reason but we'll find out today uh, yeah i don't know any i don't know anything about it. it never even occurred to me to ask the question i guess it's one of the uh unknown unknowns in this equation right and to brad to quote donald brad Rhodes you look yeah yeah wrong <laughs> Well, that's uh, it's the only it's the only thing Donald Rumsfeld ever said that I can actually remember. That whole stand up there on the podium talking about the known knowns, the known unknowns, and the unknown unknowns. Right? That's right. For some reason that embedded itself in my gray matter. So. Me, me too. Me too. <laughs> Brad, what do you have to say for yourself today? Uh -huh. Feeling good and ready for this thing. I, I thought it was a deep fake review, so you know I, this is actually not me. This is this is a friend of mine who's in the meeting for me. Well, that's well, that's excellent. You got you got somebody who's well better looking to stand in for you. Yeah, absolutely. Wait a minute, is that an AI generated beard? It is. It is. This is a brand new feature they introduced, uh, and we're trying it we out for it. this podcast. We've well, made it, people. You and I like the FileMaker shirt, too. That's very nice. Look at that. There we go. Yeah, perfect. <laughs> I want one of those. <laughs> and I got to get me one of those, too. Yeah. Well, we all need one. John. Well, John's got to make DevCast shirts for all of us. When, oh, yeah, when do we idea. get the yeah, DevCast shirt? I'm writing that down right now. I think that would be <laughs> amazing. Yeah. And Russell, are you ready to go? Yeah, ready to get ready to go, ready to do this. Okay, great. Well, I'm Dan Smiley. I'm your host and citizen developer, and today we're going to talk about decentralized or depersonalized decentralized. I don't even know what that is. Depersonalized data. And to kick us off, we're going to uh, kick to Jacob, who has written us a cool JavaScript to demonstrate how we do this. So we'll start with Jacob. Jacob, give us a definition. What is depersonalized data? <laughs> so depersonalized, depersonalizing data uh, basically just means uh, replacement, scrambling, uh, masking or blurring of data, right? even encryption. Uh, so you, you're just taking somebody's production data that's sensitive um, and converting it to something that's not the same anymore. It's... Uh, it's completely different. It's void of what it was originally. Sometimes there's ways to go back to it, reversing the process, but generally it's just replacement of data. And why would we want to do that? I've got data in my database already. <laughs> I mean, I wrote the database yeah, so... on purpose to hold the data that's in the database. 
I think it's a fair, very fair question of why you would want to do it. And I think one, one question is, should you do it? Um, we certainly work with clients where we don't do it. Um, it's time consuming. It's time consuming, can be time consuming to depersonalize the data. And if it's a, if it's an application, you know, like, like um, one of the apps working with you, Dan is, is publicly available information anyway. So why would you depersonalize it? A lot of work for no purpose. And, and then we have smaller clients that just don't really, it's not really an issue for them. They're, they're, uh, you know, it's, it's adequate for them that we have decent security so that only they can get into the database and, and depersonalizing it's not, uh, not an issue, but we have legal requirements with some clients, the, the, um, HIPAA and FERPA regulations that, that some companies and some educational institutions have to comply with the risks of having real data, um, hacked or gotten out to the public are just too great. Um, so masking or depersonalizing the data becomes, uh, you know, a, a pretty important precaution. And my wife is a, a director of nursing, and so she works within those uh, HIPAA regulations all all the time, and dealing with patient records, personal medical history. That's a big deal. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, they, a person could get into some significant legal trouble if that data leaked out into the into the rest of the world you're right the, the data that i work with that you and i are working with i mean anybody can get that data that's hell that's partly the point we're trying to make it <laughs> publicly available we're trying to get people to use it um uh, but yeah. that's a good point well if you do have these situations where I'm working on a database. Maybe I've pulled the database. Uh, maybe I've moved a, a version onto a development server and I'm working on it. It's this is no longer in production, but I need to have data in the database in order to test calculations and other features. What would be some of the approaches I might go through to make that happen? I'll just toss that to the group. What are some approaches I might use? Well, we've, well, we've got a couple of options like uh, scrambling what's there, just mixing it up, or completely overriding it with new data. Any, anything else? Jacob, you mentioned masking. Yeah, so masking, um, basically, it's the same thing as uh, obscuring the data. You just take it from one place. So it just has like a, a different form. Uh, so the data is still the data underneath. You just uh, add add like some kind of calculation that uh, changes its shape in some form. So it's like a, a new pattern. But the data underneath is still the same. Okay. Well, you wrote a JavaScript to help make this process a little quicker, a little smoother. What does that Java application do? And can you demonstrate it for us? Yeah, yeah, let me uh, grab that here. So this is a, a demo um, we built. It's, uh, it's I named it FM Deepfake. Uh, and it, it basically leverages two libraries, Node being one of them, and then uh, Faker.js being the other. Um, and basically using these two JavaScript, uh, well, the JavaScript compiler, being Node, and then Faker.js, the library supporting it, uh, we can build random, unique data for testing, data depersonalization. There's a number of things that Faker.js library can be used for. In this case, uh, we, we're using it to build uh, random data uh, for our solutions, and we can tailor it to any way or anything we want. So matching our schemas. Let's go to the demo here. So I love the name, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> um, so this is the interface uh, for this for this solution, uh, and basically, I, I kind of went through the process of what we we normally do, or, or some of the practices that we normally follow. Um, 
for depersonalizing data. And some of those processes include like importing over data that's already present there, especially if it's really important for preserving the data in the system for testing purposes. But that data, it it's not, sometimes it's just a blank random data that doesn't really fit the same model as the data that we need. And in this case, we need to be able to build, you know, you, it'd be better if you'd be able to build something that's tailored specific to the data that's in your solution. And that's where this kind of comes in. And we can actually match the record count here. So in, in this field here, uh, we can, you know, explicitly tell the system how many records we need. We had 10,000 patient records here or uh, address records here. We can do that. And then this, this is basically just a, a place to give the data set a name. So let's say this is, uh, let's say company addresses. Uh, and then we'll, we'll still say address CSV. In this case, we can select a spot to, to output to, or we can just uh, leave it blank. What format is it going to output to? So in this case, uh, it's generating a CSV. Okay, We're basically gotcha. just creating uh, re-importable data for our solution. And is it just for so one you, table? If I have child records, do I have to create a whole different uh, CSV file to import those as well? Yeah. So in this case, you're, you're building per, uh, per table. Okay. Um, so yeah, yeah. If, if it's, if the data is in another nested table uh, or child table, you, you'd have to build uh, or randomize that data as well. If that was, you know, the goal. Sometimes there's parts of the solution that we don't have to depersonalize, like preferences and, and certain things that just aren't going to change. And they're not sensitive. It's not sensitive data. In here, I've, I've basically given a few little uh Info notes, just basically letting the users know what, what's kind of going on in this process. So how we create this, uh, we actually have like a little card picker here. It's uh, just a selection tool. And these are all Faker.js methods. Uh, so there's an API for the Faker.js library that actually uh, supports all of these method calls. So in this solution, there's we have 28 records in here. So not all of them are in here currently supported, but uh, quite a few. Um, so if we, if we close this, we could see I've already added a few here. Um, so this is zip code. If we want to change, let's see, instead of the state abbreviation, let's go ahead and change that to the, the full state. Uh, let's say in our solution, we need the full state name, not just the abbreviation. Um, so let's find, actually, search here. We have state. So we'll override that. Um, and then we're essentially just generating the fake data. So in this case, it's just you know company addresses. That's its general purpose. We hit create fake data. And we see success. We'll go and view this in the downloads folder. We have FMD fake as a folder that gets created with a data folder and a CSV. So within the CSV, it's the data that we just generated randomly on the fly. Uh, in this case, 10,000 records, um, which are all here, Ran random data to import. Um, and that was, that was lightning fast. That was in seconds, yeah. <laughs> Uh, wow. So, do I can how many how many uh, fields can I keep adding fields? You got yeah, what yeah, one so, five uh, fields right now? There, yeah, there's an endless support. Uh, I mean, you can put as many fields as you need to in here. Uh, so, if your table has you know a considerable amount of fields, um, you can match them all here, and then match the the record count that you have in your production data as well. Um, and this is even good for just mock-up. So if you have a solution you built and you want to test the, you know, the capability of uh, 100,000 records, you know, for for the schema you just built, this meets that demand perfectly. You know, you're just 
generating that that exact request without you know having to go any other place. I mean, yes, there's like random data sources online, and that's typically what's used to just generate you know fake data, um, but it's not specific, right? We, you want something that's uh, kind of catered to the fields that you've already built in your system. Um, yeah, what's nice so about this one is oh, that you can match field names, right? Isn't that part of that? the benefit is you can match field names and, and make that import process a little smoother? Yeah. 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 So one of these examples in here. Yeah. So this is uh, this is actually taken from uh, somebody we're working with. Uh, it's a it's a it's kind of a mock up of their table schema. Um, and it, it, this is the naming convention used for their system. There's some specifics uh, that we we need to explicitly pass. We're only we're only including uh, zip codes for the Washington State area. We're creating random, just a random group name, which is uh, just one random word. And then the phone numbers are, you know, the phone numbers and faxes are actually in this format. So this is what we're telling the system. Please return this same format that the phone numbers are in. Uh, because that's that's how they're set up. Um, and then the same process that's, that's a, can be that's, done here. That's a lot more, sorry, that's a lot more powerful than just generate me something. That's a lot more control yeah. than I was expecting. Right. Yeah, I think a big advantage of this is that it eliminates, you know, when, when we've got clients in there testing, it lets it lets us create data that looks familiar to them. You know, we're not we're not stuffing a, a random bit of text into a, a phone number field or something. It's it's um, it looks like a phone number. Um, so we're not having to answer as many questions about why do I see this? Why do I see that? The data is all the data all looks reasonable. Um, so in here, just kind of a settings overview. Uh, we actually just have like the methods creator. So if any methods aren't in here, we can go ahead and create those. And then this is just a direct link to the API, uh, which I'm, you know, just showing the URL in this case, but I actually already have it open. Um, so if we go here, we have Faker JS kind of, uh, their website, but they have an API. And this is all the methods supported. So if wow. you can, you know, if you want to use it in your system, it's probably here. This is one of the bigger library names uh, in terms of testing with fake data. Uh, that's kind of out there in, in the general public, and a lot of people writing solutions are are leveraging this library. Now on FileMaker, <laughs> it'd be great, you know, to leverage that library as well. Uh, mm -hmm. just like other app developers. So did you um, use their API to write what you did using this data? Is that how that worked? No. So if we want to, <laughs> we want to dive into the process, uh, this is kind of building, going the JavaScript route, right? So all these are uh, calls uh, and I guess API, API might not be, the best term for their process, but you're actually, it's a, it's more of a framework. So you have to, you have to build it with another supporting language. In this case, we chose JavaScript, uh, which basically builds uh, all these methods on the fly, right? If we, if we just pass the commands to the API, which I don't believe is possible, we let's just pick a random let's say animal bear this this method call here we're looking at baker.animal bear would return us a random random bear in this case agent black bear right that's that's the, that's the purpose of its method call it's actually fetching this through the internet and ran, you know creating a random response on faker's side and we're just leveraging the library that's already doing that by rebuilding the same the same function call. So in JavaScript, we're actually building out each one of the commands. So you can think of each one of these as the explicit command to the library. Okay, so you built Does it. Does that make sense? How do I use it? <laughs> How do I get to use it? 
Yeah, so uh <laughs> John, is this a product? Can I down can I get this from Portage Bay? What if I just you've convinced me I need random data. What what if I now just want to use this tool that Jacob built? Well we'll probably be doing a blog post and including it as a demo file for public consumption here in the not too distant future. Uh in the in the super short run you can do the same thing Jacob did and and um use the JavaScript library and build it into your build it into a FileMaker solution if you wanted to. Um, but a demo file from us probably in time in the next few months um, depends on when we work it into our blog schedule and and when we finish testing Jacob's app and making sure we're, you know, feel it's bulletproof or reasonably bulletproof. Okay. All right, Jacob. Because I'm stupid, um, I'm, I'm say so what, what I was looking at, was that actually a FileMaker solution in which you were running JavaScript? Is that what that was? Or was that, what was I actually looking yeah. at? Yeah. So, so in that solution, uh, we're, we're actually leveraging, and this is kind of the part where you didn't get to see when the solution launches, the demo launches, like John was saying, once we bet the process, make this available. It actually installs Node for you, uh, so you need to have Node on your machine uh, installed, and it's basically a glorified CLI tool. Uh, I mean, <laughs> there's more to Node, obviously, than that, but that's <laughs> that's the way I think of it. Uh, just just generator process for JavaScript on you know supporting the back end, so JavaScript can be passed to that that Node file. So once it's installed on your machine. FileMaker is generating all the code required to build something for you. And then rather than you building the JavaScript yourself, I've already taken the legwork out and just created all the function calls you need. Because oh, you're a steely-eyed missile man. <laughs> <laughs> Love the reference. All right. Well, there's got to be some gotchas in this process. Can you give it? give us an idea of what we need to look out for? Uh, well, don't yeah, accidentally overwrite production data. There you go. That would be bad. Yeah. <laughs> One, um, so make sure you have a, a current backup. Isn't that what we tell everyone? Hey, yeah, is it backed up? I walk into the Apple the store with my iPad. Did you back it up? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. I mean, a couple, a couple of got a couple of gotchas that occurred to me. Um, one is it's not necessarily appropriate for every solution because it takes time. You know, if you've got a solution that has a uh, hundred tables, um, it's, it's not an inconsequential amount of time to uh, depersonalize the data. You know, it, it, if you're running a, a dev server and a production server um, and you're, and you're grabbing a copy of production data to work with on the dev server, um, you know, it, it might take you a couple hours to depersonalize the data fully. If, if you don't have it, you know, if it's not part of your normal workflow and not fully automated, it might take a little bit of time. And imports imports in FileMaker are not uh, lightning, lightning fast. So it may take some time to port over your existing data, depersonalize. And I would say the biggest risk, perhaps, is that you have to know your schema really, really, really well to know where to depersonalize. So mm -hmm. it's easy yeah. enough if you've got it's super easy if you've got a hundred tables and one of the tables is called patients, uh, you know, you know, you need to depersonalize that file. But if one of the tables isn't super obvious in the schema and it's called uh, underscore pat underscore desk or something, <laughs> I don't know. I'm just making that up. And do you, do you, do you know that it has a notes field in it that a nurse was typing, um, uh, some type of patient note into so that they put in, they typed into that field, uh, Marilyn Monroe uh, is presenting with uh, a broken left toe. Uh, we don't know where she got that, um, uh, etc. Et um, well, just your standard run-of-the-mill depersonalization won't necessarily catch that, you know, uh, Sometimes our solution for that kind of thing is just to blank out all the all the text, all the all the random enter text fields, because you can't know what a human being typed into them, so it's hard to depersonalize them. 
So that that's one of the bigger risks for depersonalization, in my opinion, is that you miss something. Um, you, know, you, you miss hey, something that's very Jacob. identifiable. Jacob, when you're using your tool, do you, are you able to say, hey, uh, generate this many characters so for a notes field or something like that? Yeah, yeah, you can explicitly define how many uh, how many characters you want used for a text field or, or words in general. Um, okay, cool. Th there's you know letters or words, uh, just a random string. So yeah, that's that's possible. So John, then so one of the downsides would be this can take a lot of time, and if you're billing this to the client and it takes eight hours to personalize the data, I mean that's a pretty big bill. I don't want that bill. <laughs> well, and yeah, <laughs> I mean, when, when we're talking about a, you know, just a hypothetical patient medical records kind of a solution, the the scale of time is different, and the importance of this is different. I mean, it, it's non it's non optional. I mean, we're we're not yeah. simply not going to have per identifiable personally identifiable patient data on our server, so it's not an it's not a option, and it's not something we have to do every day. Um, we need a representative example of the data in order for to do real world testing, but we don't have to do it with every deployment. So we might, we might only do this once every six months or perhaps not, not that often. And it, I think eight hours is a little over, over the top. Um, once we have things set up and we understand the schema, hopefully, cause we wrote it. And once, once we've decided what we want to depersonalize and, and have scripted it a bit, we should be able to depersonalize the data in, in a lot less time than eight hours. If, you, if you've if you got this production solution running on the client server and you've got a development solution running on your server, once you've got depersonalized data in the development solution, you don't really have to change it, right? I mean, it's only the development client the, development the, file you're actually doing edits to, right? Yeah. And then yeah, you... I think that's true for the most part. Um, that where where that becomes a little more challenging is um, sometimes we have a you know the client comes to us and says I can't really test this the data is too old, um, and so so then we have to get it refreshed um, because you know if if you're it can it can be very true that that if if you're running your business and you're and you're familiar with the current state of orders and the current state of reports that you're running. And you have to put your brain back into the, the situation that you were in eight months ago, which is how old the data on the dev server might be, um, that that, that makes for a challenging testing situation. So sometimes the, sometimes our, we, we need to refresh the data on our dev servers so that it's close enough to the real world that we can, um, so that especially the client, usually we can make do, but sometimes the client really needs to have more real world data in order for, for their, to do their testing effectively. And th this it? also brings up the point about troubleshooting uh, a problem in production. So if you if you wipe data in any form or fashion, then you might be wiping special characters that are causing the issue. You know, some things you're just going to have to troubleshoot in production in an environment like that where data is sensitive. Um, it, I would say 99% of the time that's not going to be true. You'll be able to figure it out, especially if it's a scripting or coding error or something like that. But there are those rare cases where you're trying to find that needle in a haystack and and you're not going to be able to find that needle um, in in depersonalized data. It's going to be because someone entered something weird or cop usually a copy and paste from somewhere that put a weird character in and it's making things go funky. So Jacob, John, any last thoughts before we close out this episode of the DevCast? You know, it... it Depersonalizing, you know, we've talked about it a little bit. It is time consuming and, um, you know, there's, there's different ways of doing it. Sometimes, you know, sometimes in a simple solution, this is, this has its own risks, but sometimes we'll just, we'll, obviously we'll just delete all the, all the uh, sensitive data and, and work with a few test cards. Um, so sometimes that's, sometimes that's an adequate solution. But it, it can be risky, um, you know, if, if you're testing with two test records and the client's normal table has 100,000 records in it and you're deploying over the Internet, you know, if it's a cloud-based solution, then you're not creating for yourself an accurate 
test environment and you can program in slow performance problems that that don't get discovered until uh, until the real data gets used so so that, that delete all approach can be can be risky but it's a lot more um, a lot less time consuming so yeah, think, along with that one thing to remember about depersonalizing the data is that the found sets themselves uh, are just a good indicator of you know where the company uh, how much data is being used and uh, the kind of workflow that the company is uh, goes through the, about their data entry process. Deleting and re-entering that data, you know, FileMaker does a lot of things really well, but creating records is not one of them uh, as far as doing that quickly. So overriding the data is generally significantly faster and much more efficient uh, when you're just dealing with large data sets. That's why this 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 solution to build these CSVs is so handy when you're doing multiple tables like this. Okay, great. Well, now I know something about depersonalized data, and I'm looking forward to seeing the blog post so that we can pull this solution down and put it put it to use. Well, thanks, guys. John, I hope your cruise goes well. Your engine's being repaired today. Is that right? Uh, already repaired. It was just a clog in the in the saltwater cooling uh, system. So you'll be you'll be underway shortly. Well, we're in an awfully nice spot. Uh, we're going to spend one more night here, and, and uh, also the the marine forecast for today: the winds are a little high out in the Strait of Georgia, so we're going to let them die down and head out tomorrow. Okay, I have to show you the new tender I bought for my sailboat. I got a Montgomery uh, Seven Eleven, so it's seven feet eleven inches long, fiberglass, a lap strake sailing dinghy. And it fits, it's up on my foredeck right right now, all griped down. It looks great. I'm going to name it Discovery. <laughs> That's great. When you, get, when you get tired of sailing, you can go sailing. I can go sailing. I can go sailing in the harbor. I can, I can sail into the harbor and drop the anchor and then go sailing. Yeah. You should name it depersonalized. No, I'm going to name it Discovery. Because right? Discovery and Chatham sailed together under the command of George Vancouver. And, you know, when they charted all these areas in the Pacific Northwest. So rather than the big boat being Discovery and the littler boat being Chatham, I done it the opposite, opposite way. I was actually thinking of painting the whole transom like the stern of Discovery, but painting in the the gallery windows in the back and everything. It's all the all the trim. Maybe even paint uh, gun ports along the side. I thought that would be, that would be pretty like cool. That. Of course. So need a good artist. Need a good artist for that. Yeah, I got a new. Maybe they can do it with a with a decal. Just put the whole decal yeah. on, on the on the back. Well, John Jacob. Brad, uh, Joe, Russell, that's all the time we have. Thanks for everything. I'm sure I'll be calling you with my own problems, but this DevCast is over. Get back to work, especially you, Jacob. Thank you for spending your time with us at the FileMaker DevCast today. We hope you found something useful, something thought-provoking, and something to take into your own development approach things that help you to be more productive and to allow you and your team to get more done in less time. Find us online at portagebay.com and filemakerdevcast.com and also on social media at FM Devcast and Portage Bay. Let us know if we can help you or your company with modernizing your approaches and streamlining your workflow. We look forward to seeing you at the next DevCast.